bad enough. What was even uh, worse for us was to see the manufacturer of this LIG trying to social engineer us into us giving the exploit to them. <laughs> okay, I won't tell the company, of course. And then having the secret service from this country trying to social engineer us into giving them the exploit, but not revealing it to the company. <laughs> so that's the kind of crazy stuff you, you start to deal with at this level. Okay, now, very fun, Philippe, great, okay, we're having fun there, but how we can have our hands on such a network? There's quite a lot of entry points on SS7 network, but each of them is going to give you a very reduced subset of protocol you'll be able to exchange with. So the best, the holy grail, is certainly having direct connection either to the STP or to the, uh, the mobile switching center, the MSC. From the STP, you'll be able to connect to all things that are database-centric. So that means uh, the roaming information in the VLR, the prepaid cards, uh, recharging your last prepaid card to $1 million, not really feasible. You'll be detected by the fraud management system when doing this. Um, then, when you talk to the MSC, you'll be talking to all the components that do radio things. So basically, the RNC, which is 3G radio network controller, or the BTS and BSCs, or more accurately, the BSCs. And then, out of this holy grail, you have other systems. SMSC very often are exposed through web gateways. Um, you have IN, which is the prepaid management, uh, prepaid card management, is very often also exposed through web services. So a lot of people get into the web server and from there manipulate SS7 and do fraud. Uh, each time I'm talking about the, these things that make me smile, uh, it makes cry the business division. So that's why they, pay, they are paying for these audits and stuff like that. Um, then you have interesting stuff like um, providers of SS7 service. It's so painful, as I'll show, to interconnect SS to SS7 peers that you prefer to interconnect to one guy that is interconnected with the whole world. So that happened at the GPRS level with GRX, and then it happens, it's trying to happen right now at the IP level with encapsulating SS7 and IP into a whole uh, virtual private network, which is called IPX. Then you can, of course, do limited stuff with GSM phones, and that's already something very interesting. Um, then you can try to get inside the LIG. Very often it's not that well protected. But these days, we have new domains like um, the femtocell, which basically gives a tunnel straight into the core network, or SIP encapsulation of uh, SS7 message. So, as I told you, we're going to interesting realm now. We're going to encapsulating the SS7, which was physical TDM links into uh, basically IP networks. That has a practical um, implication is that before you had only MTP1, which was physical network, lying, relying only on physical lines. Now, when we speak about SS7 on TCP IP, that means that already here, we're speaking of something that is relying on ARP, but also MPLS very often, and also Lambda Net, so using optical networks. So one thing is that by stacking all these technologies, you get a decreased, um, how to say, reliability by design. Since there's multiple layers, there's multiple places where some problem can happen. And we've seen more and more outage because very simply, sometimes some people just take the IP of the STP and connect the wrong equipment to which, over, uh, which takes over the IP of one of the critical equipment. And sometimes software is not well tested for this kind of stuff. But for us, the advantage it gives us is to work on something that is very familiar. 
we have to see that what we use is not TCP or UDP to carry all the SS7 on the network. It's called SCTP. Basically, it's like TCP a bit, uh, but it has a four-way handshake. So it's not TCP SYN, you get SYNAC, and then you, uh, oh, sorry, you get TCP SYN, SYNAC, ACK. You get actually init packet, init ACK, then you send a cookie, then you send a cookie ACK. This is done to have reliability against uh, spoofing, mostly. And it's also uh, um, spoofing and DOS, the near of service. Now, uh, it has very interesting stuff like multi-stream connection, reliability, be being able to connect from a set of IP and ports to another set of IP and ports. So it's multi-home connection, let's say. So right now, we're able to do this kind of scan where you send an init, you get an abort. This is not RFC. This is actually something which is a bit like TCP SYN scan. RFC says you send uh, init packets and if it's not the correct port, you don't answer anything. Actually, all implementation nearly are using this kind of uh, behavior that enable us to scan very quickly. So I developed a SCTP scan, which run on quite a few uh, software. And basically, it's included in Backtrack since Backtrack 3, I think. So you can test it very easily. Um, the funny thing is that uh, even Linux has it by default in a lot of distribution. So very often, doing a SCTP scan will be much more discreet and stealth, actually, than doing a TCP scan. Um, it was in Black Hat Europe, maybe 2006 or 7, something like that. I was presenting just SCTP scan, not the higher protocol attacks. And um, then I start to tell, well, I've been scanning the internet for three years now with like trying to scan all the IP address. And I never made it, or actually my IP address from the server I was scanning from, never made it into dshield.org. And then I start to see one guy in the front with a big sans t-shirt writing furiously on his notepad. It must have been something like fix the shit because <laughs> <laughs> not appearing, I sent literally millions of packets or billions maybe, um, on the internet not being detected meant that firewall and log analysis software are not designed to take in account this kind of software. I uh, strongly advise not to invest time into doing backdoors or remote administration using SCTP because then it would not be detected by a lot of uh, engines. So that would be really a bad idea. Okay, usage, you'll see that. There are some peering tricks because we're only at the beginning trying to connect to something that will try to accept uh, our SS7 message. Think of it as a VPN. We're only trying to get the VPN endpoint to see where we can first be authenticated to do so and then inject our traffic. So when a legitimate peer connects, of course, you get init and then init hack, uh, cookie echo, cookie hack, and then heard beats and very interesting stuff that mess up my Wireshark display. And um, then, this is cool. When you do things like, basically, attacker connection, you get init and abort. When you're not configured, you send a lot of inits and you don't get anything in reply. So that's very rude from the, this server, but at the same time, it's very useful to detect endpoint. So a further attack we're working on, which can actually elicit data from who can connect from there. We'll talk about that in future presentation, I guess. Now, fun scanning technique. Now, how to scan the SS7 perimeter? The SS7 perimeter we are dealing with mostly is not going to be through the radio, but much more from the femto cell or from STP connectivity to other cloud of SS7 or directly on the core network of IP and trying to, to connect to the VLAN or the VPN that holds the SS7 or SIGTRAN signaling. The STP we are co trying to connect to is what I called a router. This router does some kind of NAT. It's called global title translation. Uh, when we are talking about actually a phone number, it's too easy. In the telco world, it's called a global title. And this global title is always going to be translated. For example, when you are going to use um, 